Edmund Paul Litza, E-D-M-O-N-D-P-A-U-L-L-I-T-Z-A. And when we have like a little name next to you on the film, you would like to be known as Paul Litza, right? Because right. that's what people know you as. Nobody knows me by Edmund. Okay. I've been using that alias for a long time. Okay. My, so dad, my dad was uh, an Edmund, and there was another Ed in the family. So, and I was just a little baby, and when they said, look for Ed, nobody knew who to go to. You know? yeah, too many. <laughs> too many Eds. Too many choices. So my mother Maybe says he was. Ed, Ed but Ed Jr. my mother caused great constipation over this. <laughs> because every time I go and they say, what's your name? Paul Litza. Paul what Litza? Edmund Paul Litza. There goes that piece of paper. So I finally learned after you want first name, middle name, or last name. But there had been a lot of clerks and different people that made a paper that had threw, threw, had to throw it away because I, I never use it, never have. Okay. Um, so tell me, how old were you during the 1964 flood? It was 50 years ago. Well, I was born in 35, 45, 55, 30s, what, 20, that's A. <laughs> I, 50, I can, take 50 away from how old you are now. 50 away from how old I am now, I'm older than dirt. I'm, uh, I'm 79, whatever that adds so up to. 29. Yeah. So I'm going to have you answer that in a full sentence. <laughs> in a full sentence? Full, complete sentence? full, complete sentence. My age is that type of thing. Yeah, I, in the 19, during the 1964 flood, I was 29 years old. Okay, I can do that. <laughs> I think I've got her worried. <laughs> I'm not worried at all. Yeah, you should have been through some of the interviews I've been through. You're, oh. you're not worrisome at all. Good. Okay. So I'm going to have you say that about your age. How old were you during the 1964 flood? 29 years old, okay. as I remember it. Okay. And where did you live during the 1964 flood? Santa Rosa. Okay, may I have you answer those in complete sentences? Okay, I was uh, born and raised in Santa Rosa. And uh, we moved up to Eureka in 19-something. <laughs> I don't remember when, but it was many years ago. And where were you during the flood? During the flood? Uh, I was in Santa Rosa and came up to Eureka to help clean up the mess back when. And uh, I sat through the flood in, in uh, Santa Rosa, but immediately after they needed people in the uh, <coughs> Eureka area because they were inundated. Um, we sat through the flood and it was easy, to, not easy, but it was much easier than what happened to Eureka. I didn't get caught in that having to travel across the mountains in the middle of the night in convoy. I wasn't stuck for that, heaven's sakes. But as uh, soon as the roads cleared enough to get us up here, we were up here and working. We are working uh, 10, 12 hours a day, six days a week, sometimes seven. Um, who did you work for and what was your job uh, title? Uh, at that time, I, I was, all my whole career in working has been with a Pacific Bell telephone company. and. Uh, I was a lineman at the time, and so that uh, we had to clean up the hard stuff. And the funny part is, not funny, but the interesting part was I was working up here before the flood hit. I left just, just before Thanksgiving that year and uh, went home, and then the flood, you know, rained forever, and I wound up coming right back up again doing that kind of stuff. When did you know that the rain wasn't just a typical rain, that you, you, this was a, a big, big deal? About the, after the fifth, sixth day, we were starting to sweat bullets because we knew that this was going to cause a lot of damage. Even when it quit, we were going to have a lot of, a lot of things to clean up, and it uh, it's always has been, but not to the extent that it was, that happened. I mean, it was just practically overwhelming. It really was. Well, you guys never worked. I mean, you 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 guys got called out on every crummy storm, like the worst weather, probably at night a lot of times. You worked in some crummy weather. Yeah, it, it varies depending on the damage that's caused. Uh, a drunk on Saturday night caused as much damage as a flood almost because they wipe out a corner pole that had a lot of cables on it. They'd fall across the road and block traffic and the highway patrol would be there. Uh, one time we worked from, oh good heavens, we got worked all day Saturday just got back into the yard and uh, we went to get something to eat. We got called out of that back on a fire at a, uh, at a bar or somebody burned a pole down. So we worked all night on that. And then uh, the next day we had a 
another automobile accident that dumped everything in the road, so we worked on that. So we worked 24, about 24, 25 hours straight. So we were kind of tired. What sort of damage did the flood cause to um, Pacific Bell in, in general, and what sort of work did you have to do to go clean that up? It caused, uh, in some areas, catastrophic damage, just terrible damage. When the log deck at, uh, at Lolita, what is it, not Lolita, Riedel, Scotia Mill, when that all got wiped out, it took everything with it when it went, and so there was a lot of damage to that. And we. There was a house in the middle of the road on Pepper, in Pepperwood. <laughs> just, people were driving around the house to get around it. It was just, uh, it was bad stuff. And uh, great paychecks, just fantastic paychecks. You know, we, we loved it, but uh, you were a walking zombie after a week. And you know, just go do it, and that's all you could do. What sorts of things did you see um, that stick in your mind from the flood? One of the things that really stick in my mind, we were driving down, I forget where it was, on the old highway, Pepperwood, and there was a dresser drawer, five drawer dresser. It was up in the tree, about, oh, maybe maybe 15 feet. The drawers were still in it. I assume since it was in the fork of the tree, I don't know if the drawers were empty or not, but there was that. And uh, over in Bull Creek, one of the spookiest parts was a, uh, we had to dig over to a pole about where that one is there, and uh, started digging, and it went clunk with the, <laughs> with the shovel, cleaned it off, and here was beautiful blue paint on a new car. So I cleaned off the window, and the whole car was full of, of uh, paint. I mean, full of mud, the old silt, river silt. And I thought, ah. So I tried the door and it didn't open. I said, oh, thank you. Because <laughs> I didn't want to go in there and find out what might be there. But we called the highway patrol and let them know that there was a car there. And uh, I guess, I don't know what happened because we went on and did other work. But it was interesting. It yeah, was, we didn't uh, hear any stories about somebody being No, I, right, and, yeah. yeah. So. But uh, the interesting part is the aftermath of these things, uh, everything was down. Nothing worked, there was no power, just no power at all anywhere, so you didn't have to worry about getting electrocuted. And that's one of our greatest worries is because that stuff up there, it can be down, the power can be down half a mile away and it'll get you here if it's laying on, on because we ground everything and they don't. So we have straight power anywhere from 110 to 440 coming at you at 12, 12,000 volts, it knocks it off and shuts it down, but uh, the lower stuff will hang in there. In fact, I was up a pole working and I kept feeling, this, uh, I go to take hold of the strand that's there and uh, it arc about like that on my hand. And I'm, whoa, what's this? So I put on the rubber gloves and uh, did what I had to do. And then I kept getting, getting bit every time I go to fool with the strand because it's 100% ground. And what it was was this transformer up above holds residual electricity. I mean, it's 110 or 220, 440, whatever. This was only 220, I guess, maybe 110. But it was, uh, I kept getting bit because I'd lean against it when I go to do my work. <laughs> and uh, it's amazing, uh, residual magnetism, uh, electrical stuff in a transformer, it can be loaded and it can get you. So, had to be careful. I bet people were really, really happy to get their phone service back. I bet you that was, it's funny, some people wanted their phone before they wanted their power. I got a generator, fix my phone, type of thing. <laughs> they wanted to be able to communicate before they wanted to see you in the house at night because they all had lanterns and candles and all that, and they'd been through it for a long time. So uh, it was communications that they really wanted. And uh, because, you, you know, you can't call a doctor, you can't call an ambulance, you can't call anybody. So we were very popular. People liked us. For a change. <laughs> it's good to be liked. It's good to have a job where people like to see you show up. Oh yeah. To appreciate yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. Of course if you if they try to get their phone fixed for a week and you're just showing up there, they usually jump on you. And we say, okay, we'll we'll be back later. No, 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 please, please, please fix my phone. We finally learned the language that would get them off our back, you know, that <laughs> you want your phone fixed, quit getting quit getting after us type of thing. 
How long did it take you before you got transferred back to Santa Rosa? Oh, well, I think what happened then, if I remember right, uh, we were working there and then went, we're going to go home and then uh, they said, oh, well, since you're up there, uh, you might as well do a tour, which amounted to a month or two. So we just pretty much stayed. Of course, we got to go home on weekends then after that, Thank which you. was a nasty drive at that time. And did you find you loved Humboldt County so much that you wanted to stay here? Well, my grandmother was a cook at the Samoa Cookhouse back in the 20s. Uh, we've had friends up here for years. In fact, I used to come up when I was a teenager and stay with my buddy. And is this going to be seen by anybody? Well, let's see, statute of limitations must be over. <laughs> but when we were kids, 12, 13 years old, we'd ride, he had a couple of bikes, so we'd sneak downtown. And all the alleys in Eureka have no, no parking signs in them. Well, they belong on a kid's wall more than they belong in an alley. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and the funniest part, the police department used to be downtown. I don't remember off it between second and the third, someplace in there. And so we were swiping our signs and, <laughs> and I just took one off the wall and out walks a cop out of the back room into the police department, lights up and has a cigarette. And I'm trying to figure out what to do with my sign. I think he saw me just kind of turn to look the other way. He knew what I was doing. I'm sure but that's the closest been. I ever came to being arrested at the age of 12. <laughs> didn't head down that bad road of... Oh, yeah. I'm swiping signs all my life. Yeah, that would have been a terrible thing. <laughs> so where did you stay when you came up here to work? Oh, at the little motel on 5th Street. As you come around the corner, there's an old motel that's there. Can't think of the name of it. You think I practically lived here forever. And then we go down to the Blue Ox and eat. Ox, was it Ox Mill was it, or the Blue Ox? The Blue Ox was a bar and Ox Mill was the restaurant. It used to be there on, uh, just after you come around the curve, and that would be what, second, not second street. Fifth up, up, up. street? Fifth street. Not, yeah, as you come in north around the curve, and there's a, the old motel there, that first street, ABC, something like the C Street, I think it is. There used to be a, a restaurant down at the end, and we were set up to walk eat there and sign our names and they'd fix us lunch. We always accused the uh, guy that the cook there because uh, they had, they were, <laughs> he raised pigeons. And he was always happy to give us chicken for lunch in our, in our bags, in our, our lunch sacks. I swear we ate a lot of pigeons. Pretty and that, oh that, and I thought he had, must have had traps up there to catch seagulls too, because sometimes that, that chicken didn't taste like chicken. Pigeon can be pretty tough. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. So yeah. that chicken was pretty tough. Chicken was pretty tough. Okay. <laughs> and it sort of tasted like chicken. We hoped it was chicken. <laughs> At least it didn't have, didn't have a fishy taste, so I guess it was all right. So um, any other memories you have about the flood? And oh, good saw? heavens. I can remember. <coughs> I don't remember exactly where on the river it was, but we were trying to cross the river, so we shot... <laughs> A cannon off at a about a two and a half, two to five pound projector with a hook on the end of it, tie a rope on it. You shove it in the cannon, shoot it off, and bang off it goes. And it went across the uh, across the first time it cleared. We don't know where the projector went because the rope snapped, <laughs> and it took off with a mount. We don't know if we killed anybody or not. <laughs> but they went and got another projector, and pretty soon we had a crowd. We had highway patrol there. We had. All kinds of, you know, just almost like a theater. And uh, and the boss who was shooting this thing off was a third level manager. Now, for, I guess he wanted the, the publicity or something, but uh, they packed it and got it ready to go. He says, you didn't put enough powder in there. And they had different like, green bags and white bags and I don't know what color bags, but he had a certain amount of powder. We shoved another bag in there and shot that thing off. That's when the projector cleared the mountain. So they took, did it again. So we got the shot across the river and uh, just getting the rope across to the other side <laughs> and here comes a tree with a big limb on it and hooked that rope and we didn't want to lose that rope and so we were hanging on to it and I was the first one in front which was bad news because I was the first one in the river and I didn't get out of the river till I was waist deep in water with the boots full of water. Oh, it wasn't fun but uh, yeah we did a lot of things and what it really got me was the time we went through Pepperwood guess it was Pepperwood, and saw that 
dresser drawers sitting about 15 feet in the air in that tree. And uh, you think, good heavens, that could be mine. You know, that's when it really hit me. Uh, house out in the middle of the road in Pepperwood, you know, okay, house is fine. But uh, to think how personal that got at that point was that could have been my dresser. And it really hit home. And uh, there were, you know, they had all the, thank God for the, uh, not USO, what is it? A Red Cross. Red Cross. Uh, you know, with the dinners that they served and that kind of thing. Uh, a lot of people had uh, meals that way. In fact, we even had lunch there one time. It was very good. <laughs> so I've had a soft spot in my heart for Red Cross. <coughs> when I was younger, uh, I used to smoke and I, I never liked the Red Cross because they handed out cigarettes and this was 1958, 59. And you know, the little packs with four cigarettes in it, I don't know, you might remember them. But uh, they were Lucky Strike Green, which meant World War II. <laughs> this is 1958, 59. So you know how all these suckers were. I still was smoking, so I tried to smoke it then. It's like, oh, terrible. It like it would almost crumble. Yeah, so I didn't have a very good outlook at the Red Cross for that, handing out World War II cigarettes at that age. But, uh, trying to get you to stop smoking. Well, it did. <laughs> <laughs> so the Red Cross... No, I, mar I married my wife, and you know, that shot that down right there. That's good. So tell me again a little bit about the, um, when you, um, when you, about the car that you came across. Oh, yeah. And, and maybe just like right from the beginning, you know, like what, what set you up for having to be at Bowling Okay, well, the flood. Place? Flood came in and we were trying to clean things up and we had a buried cable. And in fact, that summer we had buried the cable into Bull Creek so we knew where everything was. And we had to get to a pole about from here to there and part of that maybe six feet out and had about six feet of uh, silt around it. So I got the shovel and I was digging in the silt and all of a sudden it went clunk. I thought, what in the world? Nothing going to be there. And I peeled it off and here is blue paint on what was apparently a brand new car. I thought, whoa. So I cleaned it all off and cleaned off the top and the car was full of silt completely inside and out. <laughs> Tried the door, the door came open. And I thought, no, nah, I'm not going to dig in there. <laughs> well, let's... <laughs> well, the county people know that there's a car here with maybe somebody in it. I don't know. So I, I wasn't that brave. I didn't want to find anything that was had been there since January, December. And this was April. Didn't well, you know, to. if they're dead, they're not going to get any deader. Yeah, but they're going to smell a lot worse. No, I mean, I mean, for like, dig, you know, you going in there and digging them out. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's not yeah. like you were going to save somebody. So. Oh, no, no, no. If, if it had, if it was in the flood, I sure, I'd have been right in there. But uh, I'm trying to get somebody out if there was somebody, but this was packed with silt. And, uh, uh-uh, didn't need that. So, uh, Jane, I'm going to pause you right there. Okay. We have a, a stream of light going across your forehead. Oh, oh yeah, if I If you see. could pull your chair back up just a hair and see if that's the Just get it on my nose. That do it? Yeah. I'm wondering one. if it if it's a side to side thing. It might be. Still there? Yeah, it's still there. Yeah. I grab that. So. Which way is it running? Vertical or horizontal? Well it's oh. kind of it's kind of diagonal. I'm thinking maybe come like this direction just a little bit. Yeah, forward and to your right. Yeah, right whoop. Let's try that. No. Now there's a good man with a set of brains. Am I uh, am I in the frame? No, but it's it's. I don't think that's big enough to cover it. So I think we're gonna have to. Oh, I see where it's coming from. It's, right here. It's coming right through here. Yeah, I can see the sun. So if you put it right here, it should block it. Well, it did, but then there's some on your face too, Paul. I mean, that's what they're saying. No, it's that's like, my natural glow. <laughs> You're glowing a lot. <laughs> Mike, why don't you have him pull back a little bit? I'm sorry, my halo is so strong. It's following you everywhere you go. I'm not sure. It really you're is. Go. Like I tell you, when you when you got a halo, you, what can you do? It's true. So. Well, you know we've got that big. See right, right, right here the with the. Yeah. Hey Mike, why don't you try the yellow lid? That's a little bigger. Okay, oh sure, <laughs> forty pounds over my head, and I'm oh, supposed to smile. Him, yeah. I thought we brought it. 
take the tarp off the the this thing there. Okay, and then I'll get over there and hold it. Oh, well, you won't have to hold it once it. Well, let's. Is that Probably needs to be. Well, the weight doesn't bring the branch down. The branch it, it, is it is. Down. That's why I got to hold it up there. <laughs> well, we can take this one off. You tuck it. it. I'll get it. Off. Ouch! Watch it. Ouch. Yeah, I'm just going to tell you it's stickery, but you already found out. <laughs> <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> you already found that out. You got this is a holly tree. Yeah. yeah, that was a bush. Well, oh, yeah, at one time I. Boy, it sure has gotten big. Well, we've been here for twenty plus years. But we could, the, I think I, the only other thing that I wanted to ask about was the flood as it affected Santa Rosa. Do you have any memories of that? Oh yeah. Uh, everybody didn't come up here. Wait a second. Where'd your mic go? Did I get up? And lose it? Can I you better. Hear it, Robert? Honey, this woman's attacking again, me. Again, here I am again, coming after you with the... Keep it up. <laughs> <laughs> this woman can't keep her hands off me, honey. I'm sorry. Is Any that... excuse. You know, I, there I was again. Like, oh, I think the mic is uh, attached. My, my grandma used to tell me, you're going to hell for lying, too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what my grandmother used to say. I, I just can't say it. It's good. Let me just say that part. So, um, so tell me about Santa Rosa and the flood as it affected Santa Rosa. It, well, it wasn't nearly as bad between Santa Rosa and Eureka, you know, that, that type of thing. But Santa Rosa, the Russian River tore everything up. Any mills that were down there along the Russian River, all the logs went down the river too. Uh, I don't think that Santa Rosa had as much trouble with uh, providing stuff for the grocery stores and stuff like they did up here. They had to fly everything in up here because the roads were all gone. So they were, had a closer tie to the commercial world than, than uh, Eureka did. So I don't remember that they had that kind of problem at all. You know, there, oh, sure, some of the bridges went out, but uh, not like here. Every bridge in the world between Santa Rosa and Eureka went out practically in, from Mendocino County on up. So they had convoys going at night. Cars would be stacked up for miles. And instead of coming along the highway, they went up on the ridge, that big, I don't know what they call that ridge, uh, but it's along the top of the ridge Maybe on the east, east side, east side of, uh, of Highway 101, down by, not by, it was further north than Cloverdale, but there's a long ridge that they used because the bridges along the highway were gone. And uh, the Riedel Bridge was gone, half of it was gone. And it was fine. It had a log jam against it, but it was surviving until another big log came down and hit it, and that took out the north north side of the bridge. And I, uh, when I was working down there afterwards, uh, I walked on the, from the south end up to where the bridge was gone, and that's a really eerie feeling to stand on that bridge and look down, what, 40, 50 feet into the water, and can imagine a car coming along. In fact, it was a Volkswagen bus that came over one of the bridges like that and drove off that thing with people in it. A couple, they, they survived and they, they were all right. They weren't hurt that bad, but... Uh, I think, wasn't that the earthquake? Well, that was the earthquake, yeah. yeah. That's, when, that's, when, that's when that bridge went up. Yeah. Like it, well, was the overpass. Yeah, the overpass thing. Yeah. I get those mixed up. It's okay. It's all coming back to <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, you've been on so many disasters up here, you can't keep the, the ones separate. One of the things that has come up that people have mentioned, um, one of the people who had been down in Ferndale for one of the big earthquakes had said that when they, um, when the big news crew came up from LA, they were kind of upset because the people in Ferndale had already cleaned it up. Yeah. You know, it's like people didn't wait around for emergency services. They don't up here. Uh, they take people in. This is a community. I mean, it's a tight knit community. It used to be, I don't know how it is now, but then it was a tight knit knit community. Uh, if you needed something, uh, you can go knock on the door and say, would you charge my, you know, get me my car running so we can go? Sure, no problem. And that was everywhere. Everywhere people were helping each other. You see somebody along the side of the road, you automatically stop to see, do you need some help? Great place to live. 
if you're in Santa Rosa or further south, uh, you probably couldn't get anybody to do anything. You know, just you might be a crook. Who knows? But the attitude of the people here was uh, tremendous. If he, in fact, if you were working <coughs> along the road or someplace and it was really cold, somebody bring you coffee. If it was really hot, somebody bring you coke. You know, it just happened all the time. It was just fantastic. One of the things that we noticed too is that a lot of the people, I mean, what we know from having lived here is a lot of people who live here, even now, um, they're people who work with their hands. They're farmers, fishermen, ranchers. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. They're people who are used to problem solving. Mm -hmm. And we, we think that that probably helped with the 64 flood, that people were able to step in and do a lot of things for themselves, whereas in cities, people really don't have those skills. Well, they don't know anybody, for one thing. They don't trust anybody, usually. <laughs> <laughs> Santa Rosa wasn't that bad. It was uh, still a smaller community where people still recognize that, hey, you're my neighbor type of thing. So there was good camaraderie there. But yeah, I, we moved up here because I always wanted to ever since I was a kid. My friend lived here and we went fishing together and stole parking signs off the back in the police stations and that kind of stuff. <laughs> But, what, what do you think about that idea that people here are more like better at problem solving, more self self reliant because of the sort of work they do? Yeah, uh, I I notice a difference now, uh, a little bit that I think there's a lot of people, an influx of people who have never been living in this environment at all, but uh, it's from San Francisco and everybody's moving north, you know that type of thing, and. Uh, I was surprised when, I don't remember, I guess it was earthquake or, yeah, it was earthquake this last time was, uh, I, my battery supply was getting low, you know, so I thought, well, maybe I better restock a little bit. I went on the store and there were four lines open, four catchers are going full bore and there were seven deep on each cash register and people were buying basics. I thought, why didn't you do that before? Why isn't it sitting in your shelf? You know, everybody who's lived here for any amount of time has close to a six month supply of basic foods that you're gonna, it's gonna taste awful after a while, but it'll fill your belly. But uh, people who are moved up here within the last few years have no idea what happens to this country, how isolated it gets. And the only thing is, is a boat and a, or a plane and there's no other transportation. All you gotta do is knock out two bridges and we're isolated. People don't know that when they move up here. 